That's it. We are live. Today is Saturday, the 19th of January 2019. We're waiting for Patricia to join us. And of course, we have John the Morgal. Hello, John. Hey, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> Good start. Cough. <laughs> Goodness, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I've, I've got like a residual um, like remnants of the flu that I came down with on Monday. I, I actually uh, did a whole thing about it uh, the other day on a live stream. But uh, other than that, I'm doing very well. Very well. How about yourself? Yeah. Now, how are, are you after your experience? Not a very nice experience. Yeah, no. Uh, well, it's. It, I'll tell you what, it, it makes you appreciate the little things um that that we take for granted so like a regular size toothbrush um unlimited toilet paper uh private shower uh a comfortable bed um Blanket. you know the warmth yeah warmth i'll tell you warmth is a big one because at these at these places that they force you uh, to live in uh, even though you're technically legally innocent um they keep them very cold like most of them they, they keep extremely cold like you could hang meat in there and um you know without socks or long sleeve shirt or anything warm and being uh, technically not supposed to be laying around in the bed and not walking around with a blanket you just freeze to death <laughs> really like it's it's terrible and they, they say that they do it in order to keep down on germs but i got sick twice while i was in different uh counties up and down the east coast um so yeah but that you know it, it makes you cold it makes you a bit lethargic doesn't it well you, you know i guess they do it uh especially in florida because if they, if it was really hot if it was warm and comfortable i think you would have a lot more fights and a lot more altercations because most of the time if it's really cold you're literally uh, focused on trying to stay warm, <laughs> you know, and it, I guess it keeps the blood pressure uh, regulated better. And, you know, technically, I suppose it does cut down on bacteria and virus spreading. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people have told me that it's a myth that uh, cold weather causes the bug. But here's the thing. And this is this is what I surmise. Um, we are warm blooded and, you, you know, our body regulates its own temperature. And so if you're used to it being 90 or 100 degrees, your body doesn't have to do, doesn't have to waste much energy keeping your body temperature regulated. Uh, although if it's 50 degrees or 45 degrees, um, you, you know, your body uses a lot of energy to keep your temperature up. And in, in doing so, uh, you, know, you have less energy to spend on your immune system. And so, yeah, I, I'm a believer, and, and this is from personal experience, that cold weather, indeed, uh, you'll get more sick more often. You know, you'll get sick more often in cold weather as opposed to warm weather. And, and you know, although the bacteria and the viruses probably fare better in the warmer, damper climates, at the same time, you know, it's sort of a six of one, half a dozen of the other, because if your immune system doesn't have the resources that it needs to uh, fight the, you know, fight infection because you're spending so much energy on the exactly three small meals that you get a day, uh, you're using that energy uh, for regulating your body temperature more so. And, you know, also when you're laying on uh, steel uh, or even concrete with a little thin mat underneath of you, uh, you can feel that coldness seeping through. And I'll tell you, in, in some of these places, if you're just there overnight, uh, like when you're being extradited, um, they don't give you a mat. And so like literally you could get hypothermia from from laying on those sorts of things without any, um, you know, without any insulation. And and I so, think, yeah. um, you basically had come out and then within so many hours you were on a hangout, but you were actually drinking some orange juice and that to you was heaven. Was The orange juice was yeah. heaven. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, cause okay. Where I was at for the majority of the time, um, you have your choice of drink, which is either tap water out of the faucet, which tastes exactly like mildew, uh, or you can get tap water out of the faucet that's put in a big five gallon bucket and they put this drink mix in it. It's kind of like a crystal light or like a Kool-Aid or something, but um, it's, it's sugar free. And so that means that it has aspartame in it. And I believe that it has saltpeter in it because let's just say that uh, as a man in the jail, your, your parts do not work as normal. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but also 
uh, from what I was told, now I was not in the kitchen, but from what I was told by trustees, uh, the giant bag of this lemonade, and it's always lemonade, like they do not change it up. It's like a lemon flavored, really uh, just naz. Like if you, if you ever had lemon crystal light, uh, imagine that, but like 10 times worse, okay? Do you, think, and, do you think that all these orange juices, the cheaper ones, they're just chemicals? And so basically that's what they're giving you is just a bunch of chemicals. It is. Oh, it is. Definitely is just a bunch of chemicals. Um, I don't think there's anything natural about it. But uh, on the bags of this mix, they, there's a skull and crossbones on it. Because if you were to sit there and eat a cup of that stuff, I would imagine it would make you very sick. Because Whoa. it's very, yeah, very concentrated. And the, the food colorings in it, um, it looks a lot like Mountain Dew. So it's like a milky yellow. Um They've been known to, to cause uh, kidney problems, uh, also problems with the uh, genitals. Um, everybody knows that there's an old, uh, I don't know about in the UK, but in America, there's an old running joke that Mountain Dew makes your man parts shrink, right? And, so, and it's because of the dyes, allegedly. Now, how true that is, I think it's the yellow number five is the one. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, yeah, it, it looks very similar to that. So it's no good for your kidneys. It's no good for your libido. Uh, and I believe that there's saltpeter in it um, because I, I wouldn't drink the stuff. Like I, I was drinking it at first because I asked a guy uh, in there who was a diabetic, uh, whether, they, whether it was sugar or whether it was um, uh, aspartame. And he didn't know what aspartame was, but he said, no, it's sugar. And uh, about a week later, I asked and talked to another guy about it, and then, no, it's absolutely aspartame. And um, yeah, so I, I quit drinking it and drank nothing but the mildew water uh, because, like, they, and they don't give you any choice or warning or, like, you would think that if they were using basically poisonous chemicals to to feed you to drink. Um, they would have to give you some sort of a warning or an option for something else. Um, now, the Seminole County was was definitely different in that regard, because the whole time that I was there, never did I get a uh, like a boiled egg or a glass of milk. Um, it was all processed food. Uh, but when I was in, um, let's see, Spartanburg, uh, for example. Every day with breakfast, they gave you an orange juice and a glass and a, and a milk is like a boxes. And um, same thing with another one of them. And they would give you boiled eggs with breakfast. Um, so it varies from from place to place. Like it, it's not yeah, any sort of consistency. Don't cross uh, the source in the chat room says he's got a close friend who's a prison guard in Detroit. And basically, it's got chemicals in, so the food's poison. And it's on purpose. But can I just yeah. say that Patricia's joined us? Patricia, she's Hello. gone. I'm here. I'm here. Hi, John. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. How about you, Pat, Patricia? I'm good, thanks. I'll let you continue. Awesome. <laughs> I'm listening. Awesome. Oh, okay, good. Well, good to meet you. He's a quiet one, but anyway, John. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so basically you're eating poison. They, they don't care, do they, anyway? So it's all about money. Right. Well, and, you know, I, I choose not to eat processed foods as much as I can. Like, And, of course, it all comes down to budget. And if I have to, I will eat processed food because I'm not going to starve to death. But if I have a choice, you know, I'm going to buy everything fresh and make it from scratch. And I think it's better that way. It's cheaper. And, you know, it's I, I enjoy cooking. So... Uh, but, you know, when you don't have a choice and again, uh, you have to drink water and so, but the, yeah, they just poison you. Um, you don't have a choice in it. And um, yeah, I th like, you know, mind control starts with the diet, right? It really does. I mean, like you can, you can control a person uh, by either feeding them or taking away the necessities. And when you become reliant upon basically the state for your every meal, which is really all you have to look forward to every day, um, it, it sort of psychologically wears you down. Um, and you have to sort of be strong and, and not allow that to affect your uh, work ethic and, and stuff like that. Um, and so for me, I, I think that it's, you know, the experience made me stronger. And I'll tell you, three weeks or whatever is not a long time. Um, but <laughs> it is like every 
minute can be like an eternity. You know, time. I've, I'm I'm a, a proponent for the idea that time is uh, relative. It's a state of mind. You know, or maybe that's not the best way to phrase it, but you get what I'm saying. Where it, you can experience time differently. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was hit by a car back in 2014 on my motorcycle. I can remember every instant of that up to the point where my face smashed in the guy's windshield. Um, and that was right before I blacked out. Uh, but that the time from where I was going through a green light, uh, then I saw like sort of out of my, not peripheral, because he, he's he, the, there was a guy going to do right on red coming from my right to turn the direction that I'm going. And I'm going through a green light in the right-hand lane. And as I see him do this, the time from where I thought, oh man, I thought that guy was going to hit me until the time where he clipped the clipped the back right side of my tire until when I my face smacked into his windshield. I had a helmet on and everything. Uh, but in all that time probably took about two seconds. But I remember every instant of it to where the experience... Yeah, the, the experience seemed to last a very long time. And then, you know, waking up on the pavement with cars racing towards me and, and trying to bring myself to my feet, you know, the whole experience was less than five seconds. But yeah, like you, so anyway, the, you know, the point is though, that uh, of course, if you're at work, uh, time can seem to drag. And if you're, I don't know, at Disneyland with the kids, you know, uh, the, an, an entire day can go by in a blink of an eye. Yeah. I'm asking you, I know that um, obviously as Flat Earthers, we all view Christmas as a different time now, but it must have been a bit hard over Christmas being shoved in there for weeks and over New Year. That must have been a bit yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. It sucked. Um, but, you know, honestly, the experience in terms of that, like it was actually kind of a blessing because there, there's a lot of really decent people in there. And the majority of the people are, are decent people that I would uh, that I would hang out with, you know, regularly. Um, nice people, uh, open minded, most of them, uh, not all of them. Um, but, yeah, like so honestly, I, I wouldn't want to spend the holidays with anybody else other than my family. But yeah, it sucked. It did suck. It was pretty bad. Uh, we had to sign up if you wanted to go to church services or whatever days in advance. And luckily I was able to sign up for the, 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 uh, Christmas Eve thing. And it was nice. Like they, they put on a video, um, for about 30 of us at a time in a little, little, uh, area. And, um, it was, it was nice. Like I, it was that was nice. Can yeah. I ask you on your, on your private phone calls? Even though that that I found really weird, that every day that you were in there, they charged you three dollars for being in there. Do you get that yeah. back? If you, like found innocent? Do you get that back, or you still just have to pay it? And it's no, back? no, no. So the way that works, and this is just, uh, I believe, just a Florida thing, or maybe just a Seminole County thing, because it goes county to county. So there is no sort of. Um, consistency from county to county or state to state for sure. But so, okay, when you, when you get intake, so that means when you get arrested and they uh, strip search you and a lot of places hose you down and de-louse you um, with cold water and it's cold. <laughs> um, and then they give you an orange jumpsuit and nothing like no socks, no uh, long john shirt. You have to buy that stuff extra through the commissary, which might take you two weeks or three weeks to get. Um, but so anyway, that that intake process where they hand you a, you know, they dress you up and they hand you a roll of toilet paper and they give you a little tiny uh, two inch long toothbrush and all that. It's not much. It's just you know bare necessities. And some places you're lucky if you get everything or, and it takes quite a while. But anyway, that costs you $20. So they, if you have any cash on you, um, they will deduct $20 right off the bat. If you don't have cash, then your account's in the negative. Um, and so. So basically you go to prison and you've got to get an account. Yes. So when you, when they intake you, they like, they, fingerprint you and, and process you in that costs twenty dollars off your books and then every single day it's three dollars and if you have any sort of medical call or like a sick call uh, that costs you five or ten dollars and so um in my case like by the time the first week rolled around i was negative like fifty dollars because i had a couple of medical calls 
And then of course the processing and the $3 a day. And so my family put in $50, but so the way they do that is they will deduct, if you have a negative balance, they will deduct up to half of any cash that goes into your books. So the $50 turned to 25. And then the next day normally would have been the day that I ordered my commissary, but because of Christmas, they didn't do commissary normally that week. They skipped a couple of days, so I couldn't even place an order. So by the time uh, Christmas rolled around and uh, I had another, uh, I, well, my first order was for $8.50. So I was able to get a pair of socks, uh, a hair tie, two bags of M&Ms, and uh, I think that was it. It wasn't much because this stuff's kind of, uh, it's not too expensive, but it's like a dollar eighty something for a regular little bag of M&Ms, which that's not bad, right? It's not like they, I guess I was kind of expecting them to charge five bucks for something like that, right? The way they do everything else, like the phone calls and stuff. But so anyway, so that was my first order. And then uh, my family put another $50 on my books. But by that time I was negative, you know, 30 something. And New Year's also did the exact same thing that Christmas did. So they they shut down uh, the commissary or canteen or whatever for New Year's. So um, my second order would have been $13 in some odd sense. But on New Year's Day, I was extradited. And th it was kind of funny, like, because um, I guess this was God's way of letting me know that uh, he hadn't forgotten about me. Uh, right. So uh, during my visitation with my wife, um, which is an hour uh, out of the, you know, it's one hour or less. It's usually like 50 minutes. Um, but right in the middle of it, uh, they, on the New Year's Day, they called me in. Uh, they, the guy came into the visitation room and told me to pack my stuff up. I was leaving the facility. Um, and it was, it was, that's the odds of that happening because see, uh, the way that the, 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 the thing set up, I was really worried about being able to call or let my wife know when I was extradited because uh, when they extradite you, um, you can't make any phone calls at all. They, it's a security risk, they say. Um, and they don't let you know ahead of time when you're going or nothing. Um, and so the fact that that happened during the visit, which there's two possible visits a week with a single person, and uh, there, that's an hour each. So if you do the math on that, right, the odds of uh, the odds of you getting called out for your visitation are like one percent or something. Like I don't want to get that wrong because then everything else we've said in this conversation must also be wrong according to the trolls. But uh, hold on, let me get out my calculator. But I think it's about one point, like two percent or something. Maybe I'm way. Well, off. you were lucky in a sense, even if it cost a lot of money because everything had to be reverse charged to your phone at home. But you did ring out a few times. I mean, that bit at least people could hear you and you could ring out. But that must have been really weird. Every well, five the, minutes. The way that saying. the way that that worked for for Florida, or I guess for that county, I think that state by state the phone systems are as secure as is Florida, but it's a different company for the Carolinas. Um, but so, um, okay, when you call, it's not reverse charge. When you call someone, they have to set up an account with a debit card um, to take the calls. And if they preload their account with money, the calls are much, much cheaper. It's only like $3.50, which is crazy, uh, but it's much cheaper because if they, if they don't load up a prepaid account, then they pay for the call when it comes in and it's like it's like 750. And so, you know, if you do three calls in a day, you're talking about twenty five dollars. Um, but so, yeah, like that's how that works. And yeah, it was just crazy because so all right, there's seven days in a week, <clears throat> 24 hours in a day. So that's potential 168 hours. So if you do two hours, which is the possible uh, visitation hours, right, once a day, twice a week for one hour uh two divided by what did i say 168 is that what i said yeah uh, i think that's so uh yeah oh okay it's 1.2 percent yeah that's right yeah 1.2 percent chance that that would have happened so you know it really i would say the the positive side of this whole thing is it really does make you appreciate things that we take for granted and so i think this day and age is probably not such a bad thing it, it, looking at it from that perspective you know what i mean yeah um well it was really horrible hearing it all happen to you as you know we did try and help you our bit we had to hang out on your behalf 
And yeah. uh, bl that's bling bling. She was desperately trying to sort this out because obviously Mina didn't know much about live streaming. So yeah, I tried to give her some some crash courses from, and it's really hard without the ability to share the screen and, and show somebody something. Um, so yeah, like it was frustrating, um, but we got it done. And like without you guys, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So like, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, YouTube, well, it was like, horrible like, to, um, you know, I, I told you I looked into prisons and it just seems that prisons are a money making machine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're making a fortune. Um, and there's even private companies now, for profit uh, corporations that have uh, basically lobbied their way into position where they get to leech off the taxpayers for keeping people locked up. And they incentivize judges to keep people locked up. And they, you know, where there's there's new prisons being built everywhere uh, because this is uh, when there's, and it's such a, it's a shame because when you introduce profit into things like um, corrections and the medical industry, um, it's just going to breed corruption. And, you know, these corporations have a much bigger voice than any one or 10 or 100 people because they have the lobbying power. They've got deep pockets. And we, we all know that voting doesn't write the laws. The lobbyists do. And uh, it's, a, it's a shame. But yeah, that's the way it's going. And what can you do, right? On, on that hangout um, that I was there, the first one you had when you'd come, like got out, you were talking about a person that you'd met there and all basically he did was he accidentally drove up the road the wrong way and he was being deported. Have you heard any more from him? No, I haven't. I haven't. Um, and I tried to tried to help him out as much as I could. But, you know, if you don't have your phone numbers, like everything's in your cell phone. Uh, if you don't have your phone numbers, uh, it, it would be very difficult to do anything um, because he, you know, couldn't call his roommates because he didn't know their phone number. And even still, like uh, a lot of cell phones will not uh, accept the calls from, you know, from Securus or from whatever. Uh, it's just certain cell phones are not set up to accept that sort of call. And so, yeah, like you're basically screwed. Um, and in, in South Carolina, I don't know what the deal was, but everybody's court date was going to be like the end of March. And, you know, this was uh, this was the beginning of January. And so, you know, the guy more than likely is going to sit in in Spartanburg County until the end of March. Um, now, the only sort of silver lining that I, I kind of told him to to prey on, you know, this is a Muslim guy, by the way. Uh, but what I told him to pray on was the idea that, OK, his his work van was towed and impounded. OK. And so the telephone number and the name of the company is all over the thing. You would think if the if the tow company is doing their due diligence to get paid, they're going to contact that uh, shipping company and that that courier service or whatever. They would have um, Ahmed's emergency contact information. And uh, so I asked him, who did he put down his emergency contact on his application? And after a little bit of, you know, translating or uh, fumbling around with uh, the understanding of that, um, you know, he said that it was his girlfriend. So hopefully, you know, the, that's a long shot, though. You got to count on the uh, uh, Spartanburg County to do their due diligence to have the impound lock call his employer to, to let them know they've got their truck. And then the employer would have to do their due diligence and contact his emergency contact and let the let them know that he was, um, you know, he was in, in Spartanburg County because he lived he lived all the way in I think Alabama or something and you know he drove back and forth and he'd be gone for weeks at a time or like days and days at a time so you know it might be a week or two before anybody even knows that he's missing uh, right to even start worrying and um, yeah I mean that's just. That's crazy. But, you know, they, they say that we're supposed to have this uh, right to being innocent until proven guilty. And that is just a big fat myth. Let me tell you. Well, you're treated, innocent, way. You're treated as if you're guilty. 
you're treated worse than murderers and rapists because see murderers and rapists that have been sentenced and they're off to prison um prison is actually a million times better than county jail from what i've been told i've never been to prison um, but i've been to several i've been to plenty of county jails okay at this point in my life to tell you a little bit about the the quality um and so you know from what i gather um, so like, okay, in county jail, you're basically locked up in a cell most of the time, uh, although in, in general population, they have sort of dormitory areas that are, of course, locked up, and you're there. it's all very cramped and small and like dozens and dozens of people in each uh, block, and um, you potentially can go outside for one single hour of the day. Uh, but, you know, if your rec time for that day happens to be in the morning, which it almost always was, uh, at least this time of year, it was just. Hello. John. Oh, uh, am I still there? Yeah, yeah you're back. <laughs> you disappeared. For OK. <laughs> OK. I just asked oh, you sorry. one question. There. OK. Larry. Oh, just very quick, Larry in the chat room. Obviously, I don't know your plans and what you're doing, but he just wanted to know, are you going to the meetup in North Carolina in April? That is the first that I've heard of it, um, but I don't see why I wouldn't. Uh, God willing, I will be there. So, okay, Larry, I asked for you. I'm just asking, so what's happening with you then? What's happening for the future with you right now? Are you, are you just taking each day as it comes? Oh, with you with me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm doing everything I can. Um, you know, it's a struggle. Let me tell you, because well, we don't want to get into it, but I'm just working and and praying, because uh, we're we're up against it. You know, being out of commission, completely out of commission for a month, um, can really negatively affect your life. Let's just say that. Um, any longer, and I don't know everything. Everything would have fallen apart at the seams, but at this point, you know, it appears that things are salvageable, but maybe not. I mean, let's, you know, we're, we're teetering. The future, the future is grim, but, uh, you know, we have faith and, and love in our hearts and that's all we really need, right? Yeah. Are you still sort of in the honeymoon period for coming out? Because obviously your voice sounds a bit different when you've had everything taken away from you. And <laughs> You just yeah. sound like a slightly different person now, John. It's only been 11 days, you know. And so, yeah, I'm still sort of readjusting and still uh, sort of surprised to be able to go outside and look up at the sky. Yeah. Yeah, you said on that hangout, you in, in what was it, three weeks you were in there, you only saw the sun twice. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, twice. Because, um, well, it's, when you go out to the recreation yard, as they call it, it's like a 30 foot diameter octagonal shape with like 40 foot cinder block walls on every side of you. And so you you basically have like the the eye of a telescope view at the sky. And unless it's like exactly, you know, 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. or whatever, then the sun is not visible. And, you know, if you went out in the mornings recently, it was cold, you know. And when you're used to it being 100 degrees every day and 100 percent humidity, uh, 45 or 40 degrees is very cold. And so in, in the mornings when the sun isn't, uh, you know, above head, uh, there's no sense in going out there and sitting out there for an hour. Uh, right. Um, and so, yeah. And even if you did go out there in the morning, uh, you wouldn't see the sun for maybe but five minutes if you're lucky uh, because it would creep up over the edges. Right. Um, so you, and you weren't you weren't put on a in a room on your own. You were with other people, were you? Well, yes and no. When I first got to uh, Seminole County, uh, my mother was actually a, a corrections officer there for twenty twenty five years. Um, she retired a few years ago, and so she had uh, basically a stipulation attached to my social security number to where if I was ever you know put into Seminole County Jail. Um, they would put me in what's called protective custody status. And what that means, basically PC, protective custody, PC means that um, you are locked down 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a six by nine cell by yourself with no books, no pen, no pencil, nothing. 
<laughs> well, I don't think that's a rule. Like they could have given me books and stuff, but they didn't because um, I don't know what the, the deal is. But for the first four days I was in PC, um, the, the, the COs, the corrections officers were uh, just completely, uh, completely ignorant and just nonchalant, just didn't give a damn about any about me at all. Nothing. So like if I asked them for a book, the answer was I'll check on it later every day, every few hours for for a day or two. And so like one of the things that I needed from the beginning was to be able to fill out my visitation list so I could tell them, you know, who my visitors would be and like everything about them. And like I would ask every officer that walked by uh, for days, it took them days uh, to give me to give me that that paperwork that I could fill out. And so finally I asked one of them I had never seen before and she immediately walked like 10 steps, pulled a piece of paper out of the thing and slid it through my door. And then I didn't have a pencil. <laughs> and so I had to get like, and she had walked off and I, I, before I had realized that I didn't have anything to write with, I was so happy to have gotten the paper and I was like sleeping. Um, anyway it was like the middle of the night anyway she came back and i got her to give me a pencil that, like within the next hour or two and the, so i filled it out and another guard walked by and i asked her to take the paperwork from my visitation list and uh, she took it and crumbled it up and threw it away <laughs> and so uh, the next day i had asked to see a sergeant and the sergeant came and um gave me the paperwork that I needed to do my visitation list and to um, to sign myself out of PC status. And so finally, uh, well, no, I, I'm sorry. Actually, they moved me over to medical because at that point I was coming down with a really bad flu. And so, um, so they moved me to the medical room first. So this was after four days before they, because they processed me out of um, PC status into the medical and they kept me there for three days. I don't know why, but they kept me there for three days. And that was also 24 hour lockdown in a six by nine cell with nothing, no pencil, no book. No, 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 no. I've got one of your other, well, not quite cellmate friends. I've got Dave Marsh in the chat room because you shared, didn't you, with him when you went to the conference? Dave, what's up, buddy? Dave Dude. Marsh. Dave yeah. Marsh. We're, we're bunk mates. <laughs> Bunk bed mates. <laughs> Didn't you have a party in his room? Um, did we? I don't remember. Uh, maybe we did. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. No, I don't think so. We basically, like, honestly, we were, the conference was such, um, so much fun. There was no reason to have a, a room party because you would just have a party right out in the parking lot. <laughs> um, excuse me one second. Didn't want to kill you guys with my residual um, flu bug here. Obviously, um, you've come out of that place. If that place was cold and all that, you've come out and then all the germs have got you. Well, yeah, I can tell you about that too, but I did cover this whole experience, uh, this recent uh, super flu. I'm telling you, this thing was a monster um, and I was able to knock it out cold, uh, basically overnight with uh, MMS. But that's another story. Um, anyway, you've got a solicitor, yeah? So that's how you managed to get out. Yeah, got bailed. Um, is that right? Hang on one second. What is it? One second. Hold on. Oh, the wind like was knocking something around here. It's just like really got a picked up windy here a minute. Um, anyway, what was I? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, was just saying, I was just saying you did get, you got a or whatever you would call them in America. Oh, uh, yeah. So, well, I actually, I've got two. Um, I've got oh. one in Florida and then another one in uh, South Carolina. The one here is a PD. It's a public defender, so it's state appointed. Although, you know, I, I'd like to get a, a private attorney in Florida, too, because, um, well, a public defender works for the state. <laughs> and so that's not exactly I, I don't see how it's not a conflict of interest. Like um, you'd think that we would have lobbyists. Like, here's the thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we had lobbyists that were lobbying in order to get private attorneys that are simply funded by federal or state issued checks? Because, um, you know, this idea that a state paid 
um, state hired and paid attorney uh, is going to do anything but maybe cop you a, a decent plea deal at best. They're not going to they're not going to take your case to trial and do anything spectacular. That's pretty much guaranteed unless it's a, a high profile case. Then OK. But um, yeah, like basically it's an it's a, the way that public defenders operate is it's in a they do their cases as an assembly line, more or less like they're they're dealing with dozens, if not hundreds of open cases, including yours. And of course, a private attorney is going to actually focus and give a damn about your case. And so, but wouldn't it be nice if you if we had lobbyists that were out there lobbying to make it illegal to have these state issued public defenders um, because they're they're just a joke. Uh, they really are. Yeah, it's probably because they're trying to defend about fifty people in one go, isn't it? I, I don't see how it could be any less than a couple hundred, honestly, because they just take in so many cases every day like uh, maybe i'm wrong maybe i need to look into it but yeah i'd be surprised if they didn't have hundreds do you think it made it worse because obviously when you got picked up in florida you didn't seemingly know about the other one so when the police look it just was worse for you because i just find it really strange that by holding someone else's medication it means it's against the law and you can go to prison like what <sighs> Yeah, it's crazy. It really is. And we'll see. Here's the thing. I would have been out uh, after four days because I was bonded out. But of course, because of that out of state hold, I had to sit and wait. Um, and like it was just a mess. I, I don't want to hash out all the details unless you guys really want to hear it. But it is I mean, it's an interesting story. It's educational, if nothing else. But um, maybe we should uh, it, leave it up to you guys or your listeners if you want to uh, keep talking about this topic, which is to me, it's fascinating. And uh, or we can talk about something else. Like, what do you think? OK, chat room, we're asking, what would you like to talk about? Would you like John to talk about what's happening in his future? Or do you want to listen to him talk about what he's just been through? So just put it in the chat room what you'd like. Yeah, because I got about 20 minutes and I got a. I, I hate to. Yeah dine and dash but um i've just got so much i've got to do maybe i can stay longer than 20 minutes but um i'll tell you i'm struggling you know and we i just started about because then that'll be an hour live okay and going then going next time we can talk about the future and, and i'll i, I want to get a video done this weekend but i don't know it's it's uh i hate to, i don't want to rush through the <laughs> video you know what i mean but i also can't spend eternity on everyone you know what i mean um Right, so far, two, Larry and Mango have put what you've been through. And uh, Effie, well, Moray, you know, how, how do you say that? M-A-O-R-I, -R Moray, they want the future. Sorry if I've said your name wrong. So it's 50-50, huh? Well, three, so two say future now, and then one says future. So I'll tell you what, then. Well, let me... Why don't you do a little bit of the past and a bit of the future? Yeah. And then okay. So I'll do the I'll do the quick version. So okay. So when you're extradited out of state, um, you have two options. You can either fight extradition, which means uh, you will you will continue sitting in county jail for up to ninety days, where the uh, extraditing state has to get a governor's writ of extradition in order to get you, um, or you can waive extradition. And basically, you're just uh, waiving your rights to fight the extradition and basically telling the extraditing state, come on and get me. I'm not going to fight you. And they have 10 days to pick you up. And at that point, after 10 days, um, the, the state that you're in has no reason to hold you and they should cut you loose. And so without any sort of uh, counsel, without any sort of legal counsel, put on the spot in front of a judge and a, a district attorney, um, I was told this information. And now, by the way, they also tell you that if you choose to fight extradition, the 90 days that you're there does not count for serving time in any state. So it's really? basically what's called dead time, right? Oh. Um, if you waive extradition, then the 10 days that you're sitting there waiting and you might just get cut loose if the state doesn't come and get you, um, you're serving time in that state. 
So like for those 10 days, I would have been, even though I was in Florida, I technically would have been sitting in South Carolina and that would have counted towards any sort of, you know, if I'm found guilty and if they, I'm convicted or whatever, and if they sentence me to jail, then that time would have been counted towards my, um, towards my time or whatever. Okay. I thought you were in there for three weeks. Well, yeah, I was in, uh, let's see, December 15th. I was in Seminole County and then the first of the year, that's when they picked me up, but it took four days to get there. And then I sat in Spartanburg for a day or two. So I was out on the eighth, I believe. Right. So that's a little bit more than three weeks, right? I guess. Yeah. So you've got, yeah, a little more than three weeks. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, so, okay. So I opted to waive extradition and not fight it. Because, you know, I didn't like the idea of 90 days and uh, I figured that, you know, they'd probably come and get me in a couple of days and I would be in South Carolina the next, you know, the same day. It's, a, it's an eight hour drive, right? Uh, but here's the thing that started getting me worried after I had signed away my right to extradition, to my right to fight extradition, after I'd signed the waiver, uh, I learned that it was actually 10 business days, Right. And mm. with the holidays coming, that really messed it up. Um, so I was worried that it could, they had until January the 8th um, to pick me up. Maybe I was out before the 8th. Let's see. Maybe I've got this all wrong. Let's see. Um, I can't remember which day that you streamed. Um, you got out like well, I guess it was. Morning or something, didn't you? you got out really late, didn't you? Let's see. Um, I've got my video list here. So I did, oh no, because I did the stream on the 5th. So I was out by the fourth. Wow. Okay. So maybe it was a little less than three weeks. How? Let, mm. let me look at a calendar. Hang on. It felt like you were in there ages. It seemed like it. Okay. So the fifteenth was a Saturday. Fifteenth, seven, fourteen, twenty-one to the fifth. I was in there exactly three weeks. Mm. Yeah, exactly three weeks. Because I got out like the night, the fourth at night, like after midnight at like one in the morning, right? So it was technically the fifth. Yeah. So it was exactly okay. three weeks. Okay waited till that time of day to let you out just asking um well uh, my because my bond was posted at about 11 or 11 30 and it, actually it took they they took it was very quick um a lot of times you'll wait eight to 12 hours after your bond is posted <laughs> uh, it's Maybe crazy it, was your bond, it came in late because obviously it was night time and things yeah were yeah oh yeah and it was uh, i'll tell you it was a nice surprise too um because yeah it's it's a horrible experience oh, you, didn't really. know you, mean. you basically said come and get your stuff you're out yep exactly yeah. yep and i still had i i actually uh had a check for 13 dollars um i guess uh actually it was on a debit card um because i guess uh, it doesn't cost you any money for them to let you out which is a good thing and and by the way south carolina is a lot better than um and then Florida, when it comes to that whole charging you money thing, they didn't charge me anything. So it was uh, the $13 that I still had on my books uh, in Florida. Uh, they actually, when I left Florida, they printed me out a cashier's check, which I signed over to Spartanburg County when I got there. And that money was was put on a debit card for me when I when I was released. So, you know, out of $100 that my family sent me for commissary, I, I spent $8.50 of it on the first commissary, and then I was able to keep $13. So out of 100 I got 21 bucks. They took 80% of my money for that staying. There. Well, not 80% of my money, but 80% of the money that was, uh, you know, on my books uh, for that for that stay this freaking criminal i'm telling you they are criminals it is yeah, awful like i said i made a video and um there was somebody i put in there called richard glossett because he's innocent and uh, he's been on death row for since the late 1990s and they've actually had him right next to the room where they were actually waiting to take him in to inject him and he got a stay of execution you know, half an hour later he'd have been dead and um now he's doing a big he's he's, he's getting a court case again together because obviously they there's more information sitting in a, in a in a policeman's garage wasn't there to show that he was innocent and they could have already killed him so i already looked into prisons and it's it's all a money-making thing and, well um, and 
there's another uh, another story that was really interesting to me. There was a, a medical examiner, you know, like a crime lab guy that was just crooked as a question mark. And he um, he had been uh, basically caught a bunch of times for uh, falsifying evidence and just really um, unethical practices. And yet he was still like a head medical examiner for, I think it was a county in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, like finally a big high profile case, this guy was caught you know, falsifying evidence. And, um, you know, they had to throw the whole thing out and exonerate the guy who was, you know, another one of these death row inmates. And there was a whole, like they went back and, and revisited a bunch of this guy's cases and found that, uh, yeah, he was just absolutely crooked. He was, uh, he was given the, uh, the, the district attorney and the police just slam dunk cases that were built on absolute falsities. And so, but even, even there's still, maybe 80% of this particular guy's cases that he had a hand in that the people are either dead, you know, or sitting in prison. And, you know, that's just one guy. You know, I'm sorry, but there are psychopaths. Uh, one or 2% of the population is supposedly psycho, is, you know, psychopathic. And um, there some of them are going to be police officers and medical examiners and district attorneys. And so, you know, the, the idea that we place so much faith in uh in men to handle, you know, our, our freedom, you know, the most, one of the most important things in life, I would say, uh, as Braveheart would say as well. And, uh, you know, it's just crazy. It's crazy that, yeah, we, that we allow them. In the chat room that a lot of the prisons and that they're all privately owned anyway. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's criminal. It it's really money is. making machines. Yep. Oh yeah, and you know, from what I get, in prison because they want to make money. And we yep. were sort of saying, there's a lot of cases, sort of say late eighties, nineties, probably up to about I don't know the year two thousand five, two thousand six. It didn't seem to matter whether you were innocent or guilty. They didn't care as long as they got a conviction. And I just think I said to you before we went live that I think that all these cases need to be reopened and redone again because many of them now are being re overturned anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's it's weird because when I was extradited, uh, I was extradited with a guy who had been in federal prison for uh, over 20 years. And um, he was going up to uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, this guy, he had been in prison for, I think, 25 years. And I got to thinking, I was like, you know, when you and he was in prison for um, armed armed robbery. Um, but I got to thinking I was robbed at gunpoint, uh, when I was closing a restaurant, uh, about 25 years ago. And, uh, I, I was telling the guy the story and I was thinking, hmm, that wouldn't that be odd if it was him? It was not, but you know, the guy, and by the way, the guys, there was four of them that robbed the restaurant I was working at. Um, they, uh, they got caught because they left, um, they weren't wearing gloves they left uh, a roll of duct tape that they had used to tie everybody up. They left a $20 bill and uh, they had left their fingerprints all over the doorknob on both sides. And so those guys were caught. And in, in Florida, uh, if you shoot a gun during a crime, it's an automatic 25 years. Um, and that's mandatory. So it's not like you might get out in, in 15. Why do people use guns then if that's your sentence for using one? Is it that people just forget at the time or they don't care? Um, what is it that if you fire a gun, you're going to get to, and you get arrested? It's 25 years. Well, the the way that that law went, and they actually they put it into um, they put it into effect within the last couple of decades or so, last 30 years. Um, it's a relatively new law, but at least in Florida, if you bring a gun to a uh, a crime, if you go rob a place with a gun on you, it's 15 years or 20 years. Um, if you if you bring a gun with you to a robbery and fire that gun, it's 25 years. And what happened in, in this case, so I guess I'll just tell you the story. Um, so we, we were closing up Mykonos. It was a little Greek restaurant uh, off of 434 in Altamont Springs or Longwood. Um, and there was three of us there, me, Justin, and Augustino. Um, and basically, it's in a strip mall. 
So you've got the front of the restaurant and then, you know, other stores right beside it. If you go out the back of the restaurant, it's like um, kind of like a break area with tables and uh, no cameras and not really much lighting and the dumpsters. And uh, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to drive past 10 stores in either direction to get, you know, out of this strip mall, right? It's like 10 stores long or whatever, maybe 15. And, um, and so we were at night that, you know, we'd have to carry 10 bags of garbage out the back and um, we would leave the back door open as opposed to, you know, having to deal with unlocking it and opening it every time and then locking it back. And so we were, you know, just standing around. I was putting chairs on the tables. Justin was finishing cleaning up and Augustino, who didn't speak any English, was back in the dish pit. Um, and a guy comes in the back with a blue bandana on his face, uh, wearing a black hoodie, black guy, followed by two, three other guys that were very similarly dressed, all in black, black hoodies, blue bandana, black bandanas on their faces, and um, uh, Tech Nines in their hands. So these are like nine millimeter uh, semi-automatic, looks, kind of looks like an Uzi, um, but it's like a Tech Nine. So anyway, uh, the first thing that, that crossed my mind was, oh, this is a joke, like, because we were joking around, talking, da, 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 and I was thinking, oh, this must be somebody coming into fool with us. So I got to trying to look at their eyes, and uh, they started screaming, get on the ground, get on the ground. And so I did. One of them got on my back with a broom and put the broom across my shoulders and put his knees on top of the broom, had a, a gun to my face, uh, told me to stop looking at him because I was trying to see him, and he put my hat over my face. And... Uh, they did the same thing to Justin, duct taped his hands together. And at this point, uh, Augustino was back in dish, started screaming bloody murder. And they, they were telling him to shut up. They, they were screaming at him to shut up. And he was uh, shouting things in Spanish. And so I couldn't see anything was happening. But all of a sudden, the gun went off and everybody went silent. And um, I thought that they had killed him. And so like... Uh, yeah. They started screaming, where's the cash register? And I, t I pointed, I told them it's over behind. It was like a stash, of a stack of dish racks. Um, and so they knocked it over. And luckily, the key was in the register. Normally, it would have been locked in the safe. And uh, nobody knew, nobody there knew how to get in the safe. But the key was in the register. And so they opened the register, got a couple hundred bucks. And um, then they left. And they told us on the way out, don't get up. Uh, you know, don't get up in a, until a couple minutes or I'm going to kill you. I'm, we're watching you. And so they left. And um, uh, like after about 30 seconds, which felt like about an hour and a half, um, Justin asked me, was I duct taped, which I was not. And so I got up, cut him loose, cut Augustino loose, called the police. And um, they came out, told them what happened. And yeah, the guys were eventually caught. It didn't take them long, maybe a couple of weeks. They were caught. And as far as I know, they were probably convicted um, because, you know, fingerprint evidence and such that was, I don't know. But, you know, honestly, why would someone fire a gun during a crime? You know, that, I guess, in that situation, the guy did it to shut up Augustino. By the way, he did not shoot him. He was fine. Maybe a little rattled. I'm sure he had a headache because when you're back in that dish pit, you know, it's very enclosed. Uh, it's not a big, not a big area, and not a lot of carpet or anything like that to to insulate for the sound. Yeah, and don't forget shock. Shock will sort of come in later on, won't it? You might feel fine oh. afterwards, and an hour later, stunk. Oh shock yeah, you. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, um, no, like it rattled my head, and I was twenty five feet away, and I wasn't in the dish pit. Um, and and by the way, the detective that came out found the 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 bullet and i don't i think they actually picked up the shell casing they didn't find the yeah. uh, shell casing but they found the bullet and the guy said you guys are lucky they didn't shoot you with these because they were like really really cheap bullets and uh, apparently um and i did not know this and i can't confirm this but this is what i was told from a by the detective that those cheap bullets uh, it would would shatter into a thousand pieces right when it when it enters your body and so it's kind of like a little mini shotgun blast and it's much more difficult to remove, you know, a thousand pieces that each have a chance of severing arteries and such, um, you know, than it is to remove a single bullet. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Don't you love the well, thought? And, you know, when, 
when I was on the ground with a gun to my head, like I literally, I, I thought, okay, well, and especially after the shot went off, I'm like, okay, we're, we're all going to die today. Cause you see it all the time on the news. And, um, you know, you think this sort of thing never happens to me, but, um, you know, it, it happens all the time where the, they'll rob you and they'll shoot you. <laughs> they'll just kill you. Um, and I, I don't think that people necessarily want to kill you. I think a lot of it has to do with how you react to the situation. And I'm not saying ever that it's the victim's fault if they get killed in a robbery or whatever. But I think that if we would have tried to fight them, or if we hadn't have complied 100%, as I most certainly did, you know, I don't give a damn about that man's money. You know, take it all, you know, just leave me out of it, buddy. Uh, but yeah, like, um, I think if we would have fought against them or uh, tried to protect the register, uh, they probably would have killed us. Um, and, you know, honestly, if Augustino well, had uh, shut up, he, they might uh, they might have killed us. Uh, because he wouldn't shut up, you know. What happened to them then? Do you do you know what happened to these people? Um, I, I didn't follow it, but uh, they did let us know when they were caught, and I, I imagine they were convicted. But I don't know. Maybe you know, if they had a good lawyer, they probably could get out of it, um, because that's the way it works. But may I don't know. Maybe they were convicted, and maybe um, you know, maybe they were getting out soon, you know. It's just weird. It's a weird thought, like sitting in the van with the guy that um, that just did basically 25 years uh, for the, uh, essentially the same thing. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was well, it was weird. I don't know. It was just synchron you, synchronicity. You, I mean, when you when you were like, obviously, what happened to you just before Christmas? Did you go like into shock? With all this oh, happening? I couldn't believe. Yeah, I couldn't believe I was still there. I couldn't believe I was in there for like two weeks. Yeah. I kind of resigned myself after the, you know, went to the third week. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, so that that's the the past, and we're glad that you didn't. Nothing happened to you the first time. So, what's what's happening with your future now, then, John? Yeah, um, just working my butt off and uh, trying to. I, I don't. Know, I need a better job, like because um, I'm working through a temp agency and and sometimes I uh, sometimes I earn twelve dollars an hour sometimes it's minimum wage which is eight fifty and uh, the hours uh, and sometimes they don't work you at all like you get up at four thirty in the morning and go down to the shop and they don't have enough work for everybody so you go home but so I need to get a better job the the thing is though like if you if you start a new job uh, usually you know they pay every week or sometimes every other week and most places hold your first check. And so, you know, it, it's normally two, two weeks to three weeks, maybe even a month uh, before you get your uh, first paycheck. And uh, I just, you know, I can't afford to do that. So I'm sort of stuck at the temp agency, um, you know, for the time being until, uh, until I'm able to, you know, to, to stack up some money and, and do something. But uh, unfortunately, like, I'm, you know, I, I, maybe I should play the lottery every other you know week, pay uh, pay a dollar for a lottery ticket every other week because I just don't see um, I don't see how we're going to make it work you know, um, but God usually provides for us so I'm not gonna not gonna worry about it I'm gonna have faith. You're still and, here, uh, John. Yep, you're still here. You made it to here. Mm -hmm. Yep, they ain't, they ain't killed me yet. <laughs> Oh, yeah. give me one second. Excuse but me. obviously, you had a few hangouts for fundraising and stuff like that. So you obviously got enough money then to help. Yeah, well, I was able to bond out and put down um, a down payment on my South Carolina attorney, um, who he, he's charging me twenty five hundred dollars, and so far I've paid him like three hundred and fifty. Um, but he's he is working on my case, and as long as I send him some something every week, uh, he should continue to do so. Um, so yeah, like, uh, but yeah, like he's he's seems to be pretty good. Um, I spoke with him on the phone the other day, and um, you know he's he's feels pretty good about everything. So you know, is, I, hopefully, I just uh, am able to to get him paid off sooner rather than later, and and keep the the place and keep the electric on and the the internet and everything. Um, because uh, well, actually, everything was paid this month. I, I, you know, I was able to afford to pay everything this month, but, uh, the next month's right around the corner and whew, I don't know. I'm up against it, man. You know, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. We all are up against it as a whole. I think there's not many people doing that very well or those that have 
you know, in flat earth, we've got hundreds of businesses or thousands of dollars just sitting there or pounds sitting there. So we're all feeling this pinch. And I think the more you get into flat earth, so I'm sorry, the worse your life gets. Is that because yeah. we're stepping away from the globe? We don't want the globe. And now the globe's, the globe life's working against us or something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, just, yeah like, my, uh, uh, our, our, whole, our whole society is set up on this deception. And so I, I think maybe there's something to that. Like we're going against the grain and I think maybe it'll get worse before it gets better. But, you know, maybe, maybe it's a test of our strength and our uh, resolve. So, you know, that's the way I look at it. And uh, what, what doesn't kill us can only make us stronger. So got to well, have that attitude. You've already been making a couple of videos, haven't you? We've already seen they put those out. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, I've done I've done one video and a few live streams because yeah. you know it's just so much easier to do a live stream. But I am working on a video uh, right now, and I want to have it out this weekend. But I don't know; it might might be into next week before I get it out. Um, but yeah, I'm, it's going to be basically I'm going to go over uh, the argument, uh, some of the arguments for the globe. And although I've probably covered these sorts of topics in the past, I'm going to try to take a little bit different of perspective on it, um, and, and I, hopefully you guys will like it sure well yes we love john the morgan i say when you were like away it felt like you were in there forever yeah it well yeah i mean i, I thought so too <laughs> no one of ours there especially now myself i said i've looked up prisons so you know in the uk it's just a little bit different i'm not saying prisons are nice here we don't have to face the death penalty in, in any state or anything or any county and yeah. um, so even if you get life imprisonment, you know, you're not going to be facing whether you're going to get death row or what. It will be life imprisonment. I'm not saying any of it's very nice. I'm just saying we don't. I'd like rather I'd rather you kill me, honestly. Like if I knew I had to spend the rest of my life in prison, I, I just just shoot me <laughs> for real. Like no, no lie. I mean, in some senses, I hear they've got gangs, they've got systems working internally. You know, they manage to get everything that if you've got money, it seems it work. If you've got money, then you usually get off uh, sentencing. And then if you've got money in prison, then you get everything you want. Yeah, it's all about money. Like if, if you have money, you can bond out. If you have money, you can get an attorney. And if you don't, you can't bond out and you're stuck with a PD. And uh, yeah, there's two criminal justice systems in, in this country. There's one for the rich and, and one for the poor. And you're right. I mean, most people are not doing very well at this point. Now you have a handful of people that are doing very well, you know, spectacularly well. Um, but I, you know, I saw in the paper recently that uh, I guess federal employees are not getting paychecks this week because uh, yeah, I that's not very good, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens with hey, that. Why, why were you in there? Did you flat smack? I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, and I want to I want to try to hang uh, to to put together a hangout with uh, one guy in particular. But um, I've spoken to him on the phone a couple of times and uh, we're, we're trying to coordinate something. It, it may or may not happen. But, uh, yeah, he's a, he doesn't live too far. So we'll see. Mm. So what did the what did, did, did the people like what do you call them? Prisoners? Did they inmates? Did they know about Flat Earth? Were they totally? Oh, my goodness. What no. are you talking about? No, like nobody had heard of it except, well, one guy had heard of it, but hadn't given it much thought. Um, but yeah, no, like really nobody. Now, what's funny is um, here here lately, since I've been uh, back, you know, I, I wear my, my research flat earth hat everywhere I go. And I've been on several different uh, construction sites. And, you know, some of the uh, foremen and such uh, are not uh, not opposed to the idea, you know. So it's uh, it's interesting. Well, that's good, especially if they're employing you. Well, especially the ones that, I've found that the ones that wear Freemason rings um, don't seem to oppose it much at all. So, what, who would have thunk, right? If you went into work today and said, "Hey, everybody, I'm a flat earther," half the people are going to lose their jobs from just for just saying that. Yeah, well, that's one of the good things about working for the temp agency is like they they can't fire me for any reason. I mean, unless I do like absolutely stupid things. Um, you know, the temp, they can just do not repeat me to that job and the temp agency will send me on something different tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, no, like they're not going to fire me for wearing a flat earth hat. Like, <laughs> you know, 
Hmm. Well, it was great to see you because obviously you didn't know you were getting out, and then suddenly I was going to go to bed because I was really tired, and then suddenly I saw the morgue. I thought, oh, I'll have to watch this because obviously Mina had been doing some, and then um, and then there you were, and I was like, oh! But I said you were drinking the orange juice, and it was like the orange juice was just so delicious. You loved eating oh the orange. Juice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like it's totally true. Like the food sucks. Um, Seminole County food was actually not that bad, but yeah, I think it's just full of chemicals and the, the drink definitely was. And so, uh, any sort of cuisine, like even stuff that I didn't much like before, I'm, I'm just really grinding on. So, uh, yeah, there is a plus side to everything. I did always you put say a link in the chat room, John. I did. I was just going to mention, um, if you guys wanted to send me a, a contribution, it's paypal.me slash the morgile or patreon.com slash the morgile. Um, PayPal is uh, instant one time and patreon.com is recurring monthly as little as a buck a month. So shameless plug there. Sorry. Hmm. Um, I was just checking there because um, it, it didn't have an, uh, a spanner on it. I'm sure you're spannered up and I've given you a spanner. Oh, no, I don't. I don't see one on my end either. No, you've given you one just now, so um, it'll come up next oh, time you're okay. okay, you Are you using a different account then? No, I changed my profile picture. Like I, I used, Ooh. I had a one that I took back in um, uh, probably 2013, and um, I just took one in uh, Denver, and I used that one. I changed it on most of my social media stuff, so that's why okay. there's a new picture. But no, I didn't change the account. Oh, okay, I don't understand why you didn't have a, a wrench, but you do yeah. now. Um, okay. just ask, was it, was it, did it affect you at all? Has it made you feel a bit depressed or are you just going with the flow? Or are you no, the opposite, things? like the opposite of that, like when you're, when, you're in, when you're incarcerated like that, when you get out, it gives you a fresh uh, perspective on everything. Like I, I appreciate everything much more. Um, so I, I think all in all, it's, it's affected me positively. Um, spiritually, um, not so much in terms of, uh, hang on one second. Yeah, everybody's getting these colds. And yeah, not, not so much in terms of, uh, you know, uh, real world issues, but yeah, spiritually, I think it's been a positive thing. So. Yeah, you sound a bit different, actually. I don't know what it is. I can just feel it in your voice. Well, yeah, I, well no, it's almost as if I'm losing my voice. Um, no, no, but, apart, apart from that, I do know you've got a slight croak in your voice, but well, no, of... like what what happened was okay. So Monday, while I was at work, I, I had a flu hit me like a ton of bricks. Like it came on really strong, um, sore throat, cough, uh, runny nose, fever, body aches, chills, and this was the first within the first hour. So this hit me like a ton of bricks, and um. Uh, when I got home from work, by the time I got home, I had a stabbing ear infection as well. I mean, if I grazed my ear uh, with my finger or with anything, it felt like someone was stabbing me in the brain with an ice pick through my right ear. And so um, I, I did MMS protocols for a few hours. And by the third hour, my ear, the ear infection was gone. And the next day I woke up, the, the sore throat was gone. The fever was gone. I just got residual um, because like my, my phlegm was, was fluorescent green. Um, and so this is more like a residual of that. Yeah, my immune system kicked its ass by this. It started Monday and my immune system kicked its ass by Tuesday. But, you know, it sort of it, it hangs around with you until your immune system is able to completely clean out all the infection. But uh, this was a uh, this was a super bug. I don't know what the hell it was, but it it hit me like a ton of bricks. And thank goodness for, uh, for MMS. In America and the UK getting this. In fact, in the UK, people have been in bed. Mm -hmm. in well, fact, I, went, I went to work and the woman said I've got to go to bed and feeling really ill I'm thinking she said I don't want you to get it I was thinking yeah don't come near me just don't come I don't want it <laughs> yeah yeah no, well see this is the third time I've been sick in the last month um I, I got sick first week in Seminole County and then I was uh, I believe I caught something when I stayed over in Houston County Alabama um, because everybody there was sick everybody the the CEOs everything um and then now thank God I've got my MMS, uh, which is, if you guys don't know, chlorine dioxide. Um, just look up Jim Humble and MMS or chlorine dioxide. And um, yeah, like, thank God for that. Yep. Mm. It's anti, so anti-parasitic, antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, water purifier, and there's no sort of side effects. So 
I keep the stuff. I, I paid 25 bucks for what I've got like six months ago and it's barely halfway gone. So it's not like it costs much. And I don't tell people where to buy it or where I buy it. You can get the stuff anywhere. It's just uh, sodium chloride, 28% solution and um, citric acid, 50% solution. Or you can use hydrochloric acid, 6%. Um, but either way, so the, the end result is chlorine dioxide. And uh, I'm not a doctor. Don't, don't purport to provide medical advice. It's just personally, anecdotally, MMS has helped me with everything from basically regrowing my finger after I bisected it with a lawnmower blade on accident oh, to uh, this, yeah, this most recent uh, thing with a super flu. And yes, MMS kicked its ass within o overnight. So maybe yeah. your immune system was a bit down because you've been stressed out by being put away and then i was wondering you said you went like to two places you said the first one was really cold was the second one like that yes yes uh but houston it's, it's like we went from florida to alabama back to florida to georgia to south carolina and um in, in houston county alabama it was not cold it was actually overly warm and it was filthy. Oh, my God. I've never been in more of a filthy place. It was disgusting. Um, and then uh, Jackson County, Georgia, was actually like a – it was almost like a Ramada. Like, it was very nice. Was like, basically brand new. Basically, you got a tour of, of the jails. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did the jailhouse tour of the eastern – the whole east coast. I mean, yeah. Uh -huh. So why did they pick you up to come back almost past and then go, well, what do you reckon that was about? Or didn't you mind? Because at least you were, I suppose you were traveling. At least you might have been able to see out a window. Was it all, did you, was the van, they took you and was it all no windows in it? Well, what we did was, yeah, there were windows. So it was like a regular sort of van. Um, the windows were tinted and within the back seat, it was like a steel chicken wire cage uh, all the way around. So yeah, you could look out the windows. And uh, they fed us uh, like Wendy's and Burger King and uh, Little Caesars on the way up. And um, yeah, it was, you know, that was actually kind of nice. The people that drove were very nice. Like I would, uh, I, I would uh, hang out with them on the weekends if, uh, if so given the opportunity. Um, that was, that was actually kind of nice. Um, but so, so yeah, the, the two Spartanburg and Seminole County were both very cold, like too damn cold, like uncomfortably cold. And um, and uh, the the one in Alabama, the, the one in um, Georgia, were actually the one in Alabama was was hot, and the one in Georgia was actually nice. Like, just uh, asking you, I mean, we, we've just said that most of these places are private and blah blah blah. But like, what um, what did they treat you like? The actual guards and all that. What were they like? Well, you know, you've got some that. I'll tell you, there's a special place in hell for them. <laughs> and then you've got some that are actually decent human beings. Um, but, you know, I, I can't, you can't hold it against them personally because do, do you remember the study that they did at some Ivy League school back in the 70s, I think, where they uh, randomly picked volunteers and they put half of the volunteers in prison guard uniforms and the other half of the volunteers in orange jumpsuits and they locked them up. They had the guards... Um, basically gave them free reign to uh, be in control of them. And more or less, any it's just a human nature condition, I suppose, that people, you give them a little power and authority over others, and they start power tripping. And, the, you know, they found in the study that uh, the, the, the guards were almost instantly, within the first day, uh, prone to abuse of the inmates. And uh, even the, uh, the doctor running the study uh, ended up after several days because the conditions got just horrible. Like it was people were going to start dying soon. And he had to take a step back from the experiment and say, oh, my God, I've let this experiment get so out of hand that people are almost dying. Or maybe somebody did die. I don't remember the details, but um, that he had to that he realized that he himself had removed himself from humanity uh, for the sake of science, just as the prison guards had removed themselves uh, from humanity for the case of this really quite silly authority that they uh, perceived, you know, perceived authority that they had over the others. 
And so they ended up cutting the experiment short. I think it was going to go for a month and they cut it off after like a few days or a week or maybe I've got the times wrong. But yeah, so you can't hold it against them. I mean, you, you give someone authority over others and I would say 70 percent of them uh, let it go to their head. Although, you know, even the ones that are decent human beings, you know, they still slam the door shut on you and they still uh, get to go home every day. And, you know, again, my mother was a, she retired from Seminole County. She was a CEO there for years. And um, from, from what I gather and from what she's told me, she would, uh, she would treat the, the inmates with respect and humanity. But uh, that's not all of them. I mean, not by a long shot. A lot of them are um, just horrible to you. Like they treat you like dog doo doo, you know? So just because um, I know that you, you're going to have to go soon because uh -huh. you said that you were going to be here an hour and mm -hmm. don't want to, you know, you've got to... What were the prisoners like? Yeah. Were they the same? Was there a hierarchy with you lot or were you just stuck there and everybody was quite nice? I mean, he did say sort of that at the beginning, but if the guards are like that, were the prisoners like that or not? Um, I, I didn't have any problems. Everybody more or less got along. Um, I, they were good people, man. Um, you know, nice, decent people for the majority. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a shame, but yeah, that's who's in there right now as we speak are lots of innocent and decent people. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Then, so your, your near future, you're going to be making videos. You might go to that meet if you can get to it. The one is, is Carolina, yeah. isn't it? South yeah. North Carolina is not too far. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so anything else that you're doing, or are you just taking each day as it comes and relaxing and sort of like, because, yeah, it's probably not no, very no nice. No relaxing, no relaxing. I've been, uh, I've been working like an Israeli well, slave. I mean, so today, you know, obviously today, but of course, um, right here in my little neighborhood, directly next door, um, they, they busted out the skill saws and hammers because they're rebuilding my neighbor's deck at uh, like 830 in the morning. So I was, <laughs> you know, oh. I was not thrilled about that because, no, I mean, like I, what I my day goes like this. I get up at 430 and I get get ready, go to the to go to the temp agency and then um, usually drive a couple of people to different job sites, then go to work myself, usually eight or nine hours, then, you know, drop a couple of people off. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm usually up from four 30 and I walk in the door at usually five 30 or six. So it makes for a long day. And I, like, I just don't have any spare time. I, I really, what I enjoy doing is working on videos and, and, you know, doing live streams and such, but, um, yeah, I've just got, just got to do what I got to do for now. I mean, you know, I, I don't mind working, but the minimum wage is just ridiculous. Like, you know, work all day for 60 bucks and minus taxes. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah, the thing is agreeing. the minimum wage is just ridiculous and it doesn't cope yeah. with what they're doing. It doesn't. Yeah. Well, luckily, um, I am on a, a semi steady job, so they, they might need it. Like they needed us a few days last week and they may need us a few days next week where I get, um, I get semi skilled, uh, pay so that's like 12 bucks an hour so that's a little better i mean it's 50 percent more um but even that you know that's nothing to write home to mom about um yeah and yes, it's, it's hard work say, uh they're talking about something else new horse but we're slaves we're slaves yep damn right but yeah let me uh i guess what i'll do is i'm gonna run because i'm gonna try to uh try to work on this video this weekend and uh See if I can't get it done and rendered before uh, before Monday morning. But if okay. not, I'll can get it you, done next week. Can we say goodbye on air to the chat room? Can you and me just say goodbye off air? Uh, anyway, if that's sure. okay. Sure. Anyway, and hey, uh, by the way, I see Ute's there. Hey, Ute. <laughs> I always like to holler at Ute. He's been, uh, he, he's been around a while. Yeah, he's quite faithful in Sun and Moon as well. So, hi, <laughs> chat room. Chat room, thanks very much. John was just popping on to obviously tell us a little bit about what's happened to him and that he's out and everything. It's been really great as always. You know we love you, John. Um, we're back later on with Flat Earth Dude because we're going to the Flat Pizza Party and, and then out to a flat smack in Hollywood later on, starting about midnight UK time, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon for... Um, that's eight hours, isn't it? Yeah, for America, in uh, California. But anyway, thank you so much, John. We wish you best. Love you guys.
We'll say goodbye off air, you and me, John. But bye on air. Okay, love you guys. Bye. Bye. Love you, John.